So we have arrived at modern times with James Simpson as our first guide through modernity. Please. A paradox. Early modern smashes of images had their own images made. William Dowsing, responsible for the destruction of upwards of 90% of the religious imagery in East Anglia between 1643 and 1644, seems likely to have had this charming portrait painted of himself. The simple and obvious resolution of our paradox, and there is an easy resolution, but I forewarn you, it's wrong. The simple and uh, easy resolution of this paradox is this, that there is a difference between the religious image and the secular image. Smash as many religious images as you will, and this has no effect whatsoever on the status of the secular image. Why? Because the secular image will not elicit idolatry. It's fine. No viewer is likely to treat the secular image as divine. So the argument would predictably go. Secular images of humans are wholly irrelevant to and deservedly escape sanctions against religious images. So in this very brief talk, I begin by tracking the legislation, uh, the early modern legislation that would support this uh, simple an apparently plausible resolution of my paradox. The resolution, however, is wrong. Ferocious repudiation and destruction of the religious image cannot help but spill over into and profoundly redefine the so-called secular image. And so I address this phenomenon, the definition, the uh, profile, rising pro profile of the secular image, rising profile and different meaning of the secular image in my second section. And in my third section, I turn to images of this kind, images of the human portrait. The, uh, the pre-Reformation self was dependent on mediated representation in two senses of the word representation. A saint made representation to a god on behalf of the individual Christian in the way that a lawyer might represent us in a legal case. But in addition to that form of representation, the individual Christian used physical representations, i.e. images, of saints as foci of prayer. So fierce early modern Reformation repudiation of the theology behind these representations of saints must inflect the Christian sense of self. Destruction of the images that channeled prayers of uh, patron saints must also however, inflict the self now bereft of any form of representation, either spiritual or visual. So the third and final section of my short talk turns then to the Reformation moment when iconoclasm turned in to the psyche. Definition of the early modern self became primarily a matter of self-harm. The iconoclast was cruelly compelled to deface images uh, in his or her own mind, um, which had been so abundantly produced from within the psyche. Iconoclasm comes in phases, and the first phase of a wave of iconoclasm is terrific fun. It's great fun to walk around a church with a hammer, smashing images. It's kind of 
a carnivalesque liberation. Uh, that's true of the period of Reformation uh, iconoclasm in England, at any rate, between uh, 1538 and, let's say, 1570 or so. But the second phase is really not fun at all because the second phase turns into the psyche where the iconoclast must destroy the images in the mind uh, itself. And as we can all imagine, this is really not fun. It's a matter of self-harm. So let me turn to my first section then to the uh, and start with the uh, early modern legislation in England uh, focused on iconoclasm. Uh, England experienced more than a century of legislated iconoclasm of every single religious image, quite a tall order, uh, from 1538 to 1643. This project of state driven iconoclasm was longer and more systematically legislated than anywhere else in Reformation Europe. The stages of the story can be very quickly told. 1538, we're going to break all those images to which idolatrous cult is provided, is supplied. So images before which the credulous peasant will be uh, practice idolatrous uh, cultic worship, we'll destroy those ones. But of course, it turns out to be really difficult to, to decide which uh, peasant is being idolatrous and which not. So by 1547, look, this is too complicated. We're going to smash every single religious images, image. Uh, but by 1550, we're going to stop at just a whisker with Edward VI, 1547 is the beginning of Edward VI, 1550. Okay, we're going to smash every religious image, but not the ones of, not the images uh, of uh, noblemen. Um, and by 1559, that is repeated. Uh, we're going to... Uh, uh, smash all images, shrines, pictures, paintings, all other monuments of feigned and false miracles, pilgrimages, idolatry, and superstition. Um, but in the 1550 statute, we have, as I say, for the first time, a reservation that images of noble folk, of noble people, uh, will be saved from the iconoclast's hammer. In 1644, uh, representations of the Trinity, angels and saints, etc., uh, will be um, destroyed, not only in churches, but in any open place within this kingdom. And more startlingly, the sources of music were also going to be destroyed. They were ordered to be destroyed by legislation. All organs shall be taken away, utterly defaced, and none other music set, uh, none, none other set up hereafter in their places. So what we observe in this uh, century-long period of uh, legislated iconoclasm are at least three phenomena. Uh, firstly, the first and second can be described as examples of what is now called scope creep with regard to our own contemporary iconoclasm. Firstly, we detect what might uh, be called scope creep of the place of destruction. That place becomes ever more extensive, starting within churches, but by 1641, moving out into all public spaces and all private spaces. There's no secret closet at home where you're prepared behind a curtain to, uh, to, to, to keep a religious image that will have to be invaded and smashed that image. Secondly, we observe a scope creep of the targets of iconoclasm. Initially, it's saints to which uh, idolatrous worship is made, then all images in churches, and then by 1644, not only images, um, 
but also aspects of church furnishing or musical instruments and uh, everything that, that might be idolatrous. By 1547, the Edwardian statute promised destruction of images or statuary of, uh, promised not to uh, destroy images of noble, noble families. So what we have in this period of destruction, of, of iconoclasm is the definition of a secular image, uh, the image of the, uh, the noble person. Um, the secular image is being redefined. Uh, but the secular image is, as I think we can see, the child of the religious, religious image, but the child is an orphan who must not acknowledge its parentage. Um, protection of the portrait in Britain, the secular portrait, was especially important because royal, uh, royal portraiture relied on this uh, defence of the secular image. But uh, the secular image was being threatened by uh, Calvinist uh, sanctions uh, on all images. But even Calvin, even Calvin recognised that destruction of all religious images was just too much. So Calvin said, OK, we're going to have uh, some images, but images which will be f images and fashions of bodies without expressing any things done by them. So they're going to be still, still life. And the second set of licit subjects, uh, which are only designed to give pleasure, are, um, are what Calvin says... Uh, on the second, uh, we'll have images of lézards, montagnes, rivières, personnages, campagnes, sans aucune signification. So we're going to have uh, landscape, yeah, we're going to have still life, we're going to have images of people without any meaning whatsoever. So things that don't mean anything, we can have, uh, we can have pictures of them. So the religious, the secular image is defined, these are after all the great, uh, new genres of European art, aren't they? Landscape, portraiture, still life, things without any meaning whatsoever. So that is the way in which the secular image is being presented. So what does it feel like, I turn to my third section, what does it feel like to be a secular image in this world? From the very beginning of iconoclasm in England, image destruction was to be really painful. It was going to hurt. No pain, no gain is the message from Strasbourg sent by Martin Busser to uh, English evangelicals in 1535. He has uh, a, 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 a treatise in which he says that Hard handling is going to be necessary. Images must not be attacked softly and so tenderly handled in the manner of weak-minded men who with a foolish imagination are wont to have compassion and to sorrow somewhat when they are broken. No, uh, the breaking must be official, it must be pitiless, and the work done according to the dictates of scripture. We ought to break them, yea, and all to powder, that they, might, that they might never be made whole again or be restored into so wicked an abuse. The problem with iconoclasm in this period, and the problem, interestingly, of all iconoclasm is that once started, it's really difficult to stop. The job is never done. Every religious image, yeah, well, that sounds easy enough. It's, there's quite a few of them, but we're going we're gonna to work through it. Uh, and then suddenly, oh, this is an, a religious image. Oh, the king is being created in a religious way. We'll have to kill him as well and break every one of his uh, images. So the job is never, ever done. Once started, it can't be stopped. And it really hurts because... The thing you've got to do that is most challenging and most painful is break the image 
in your own mind. If you think having a secular portrait is going to be great and beautiful and fun, then, says the history of iconoclasm, think again. It's going to hurt. Thank you very much. Thank you. But James, James, uh, did these new secular images, the portraits, the still life landscape, heal the sort of the wounds of the self harm inflicted by iconoclasm? I'll answer that in a very broad way. The great story of Western iconoclasm, and we have to realise when we see ISIS and Daesh doing their ghastly work, we have to realise that we are ourselves iconoclasts. We have our own terrible history of massive image destruction. Um, but the good thing about our story, there's good news and there's bad news. The good news is that we did actually work out a way of managing it. And one of the ways was to devise these new secular genres and to reinvest them with profound power. Think of those Dutch still lives, which are absolutely saturated with Eucharistic sacramental power, despite seeming not to be. Um, so uh, the good news is that we did devise ways of managing uh, the the, and the the bad news is the destruction of images a along with the museum. The bad news, I'm afraid, is it took 150 years before we'd effectively managed to keep iconoclasm roughly under control. Thank you, James. Thank you, Marie. <laughs> Marie Kotha Doda, welcome on the stage. Thank you. It will be a pleasure listening to you. So over the last couple of years, we have seen a lot of this and also this. And these actions have frequently been described as cultural vandalism. When we mention vandalism, it summons a very different image from iconoclasm. If we think of vandalism, we might not think of the vandal invasion through Europe or the sack of the Roman Empire, we would think of people who destroy things that they don't really understand. We are a bit more uncomfortable with the word iconoclasm. Iconoclasm, as we've heard today, has happened in very different ways across history, but it seems to be either far, far away, like with the Buddhas in Bamiyan, or happening a long time ago it seems very incompatible with the ideas of rationality and tolerance that we've inherited from the Enlightenment. But what if we asked an actual philosopher of the Enlightenment his thoughts about iconoclasm? With me in the studio is Denis Diderot, who writes in 1765, my friend, if we love truth more than the fine arts, let us pray God for some iconoclasts. Diderot did not believe in God. He did not either believe in an objective truth, but one thing he knew was that the arts are an incredibly powerful way of conveying ideas. The idea of equality was the supreme idea that the Enlightenment left in France. Equality became the supreme good, and in the name of equality, the French Revolution happened. The French Revolution put an end to the absolute monarchy and to the feudal system, but the idea of removing the traces of a king or a reigning dynasty is not specifically new in history. Here we can see, well, the coffin of Akhenaten being beheaded, a beheaded statue of Nero, and I really like this defaced family picture where the picture of Gita has been erased by his brother. So this has been called in 1689, 100 years before the French Revolution, Damnatio Memoriae. It might be a Latin phrase, but it's relatively modern, and it is a condemnation to oblivion. When a king was condemned in this way, his name, his face, would not pass on to the next generations, and it was a convenient way to deal with an uncomfortable immediate pasts. So what do we do when the immediate past is so uncomfortable that we can't really own it anymore? 
in the case of the French Revolution, before it happened, France was divided in three orders. There was the clergy, the people who prayed, the nobility, people who fought, and the peasants, the serfs and bourgeoisie, people who worked. A caricature of this is that, oh, well, the clergy and the aristocracy are the super wealthy and everyone else is toiling in dreadful circumstances. Well, this was not actually the case. The third estate paid taxes to the nobility and the clergy, but the third estate ranged from the impoverished peasant suffering from the famine and the very bad economic circumstances to the super wealthy merchants who didn't really want to pay more taxes and also, because of the leasing feudal system, couldn't acquire land. So that was a major impediment to the mobility from the third estate to the second estate. By 1789, the ideas of the Enlightenment had moved so deep within the French society that the three orders wanted to reach some sort of agreement. Little did they expect that by the 14th of July, 1789, the Bastille would be stormed. The Bastille is a fascinating building because by the time it was put to fire and burned down, there were only seven prisoners there, among whom the infamous Marquis de Sade, but La Bastille was where the king could send someone without a trial. So it embodied the power of the king as a supreme judge in the nation, which is something that the new thoughts of the Enlightenment could not tolerate anymore. So when the 113 guards of the Bastille were captured by the revolutionaries, six or eight of them who had surrendered were executed on the spot without a trial. Aside from the Bastille, other monuments that had a religious importance were also destroyed. Here we have the Église Saint-Barthélemy that was pulled down in 1791. But there were also items that catalyzed popular piety that were completely burned down. For instance, this reliquary, an extremely precious 13th century work of art that used to contain the remains of Saint Geneviève, the patron saint of Paris, it was burnt on the Place de Grève, where most of the capital executions would happen, and the ashes were thrown into the Seine. The reason for this is that these items meant much more than what they were. These were not just objects, they were icons. Think, for instance, of the equestrian statues of the kings. Every city in France used to have an equestrian statue representing most of the time Louis XIII, sometimes Louis XIV. Here we have the Place des Vosges as it used to be before the revolution with a statue of Louis XIII. These statues have been pulled down and melted to be turned into cannons. The reason for this is that they represented the physical presence of the king in the places where the king was not. But the thing is that the king himself represented the authority of God because he was a divinely instituted monarch. So in a way, the first attack on the king's authority happened on the 10th of August, 1791, when King Louis XVI accepted the French constitution. All of a sudden, he was not a divinely ordained king anymore. He was the head of a state acting in consultation with the rest of the body of the state. This did not stop there. As you know, on the 21st of January, 1793, Louis XVI was executed and his execution happened just like a ritual. When the king tried to address the crowd, the drums rolled to cover his voice. And as his head was chopped, it was lifted and showed to the crowd. Then a man climbed onto the scaffold, dipped his arms in the bucket that was filled with the king's blood and sprinkled the crowd with it three times, saying that this would bring them luck. This did not stop with the death of the king. It extended to the rest of the royal family. Marie Antoinette was executed too. Many other members of the aristocracy had to die because they represented in their body what the revolution opposed. The fascinating aspect of the French Revolution is how stone, flesh and ideas became one. Here you have the gallery of the kings of Judah at the top of Notre Dame de Paris. All of these statues were beheaded. 
Similar destructions happened in the Basilique de Saint-Denis, where the remains of so many kings and queens of France used to be kept. The revolutionaries stormed to the Basilique and threw out the ashes of 42 kings and 32 queens among, uh, in, in the Seine and also threw the ashes of many bishops, princes and dignitaries of the realm. This might sound like crazy mob movements and controllable flows of the population that we can't really master, but it was in fact directed by the National Assembly itself. So on the 14th of August, 1792, the National Assembly stated, I quote, that the sacred principles of liberty and equality do not make it possible to leave under the eye of the people monuments erected to pride tyranny and feudalism. The Commune des Arts, Commune of Arts, was created to decide which works of art were compatible with the revolution and which were not. So the works of many painters and engravers were condemned as being, I quote, containing obscenities which revolted the republican morality. The intensity of the iconoclast purge, starting with the fall of La Bastille, culminating with the death of the king, then expanding to the destructions of all these works of art, leads to see revolutionary iconoclasm as a form of scapegoating, where the people and the objects that represent the former regime have to be executed so as to guarantee the purity of the new regime. I would like to point out three consequences of the French Revolution. First, new symbols were created. The fleur de lys was replaced by the tree of liberty, the king's throne was replaced by the altar of the fatherhood, and the Virgin Mary with her blue coat or her blue veil was replaced by Marianne with her red liberty cap. Marianne is the ultimate impersonation of a headless state. You'd see this figure in French town halls, you'd see it on stamps, and it's the best way to represent a head of state that does not really exist. Second consequence of the French Revolution, the word vandalism became fashionable. As early as 1792, some members of the Assemblée Nationale questioned the fact that so many destructions would happen, but l'abbé Grégoire was the first one who stood and said, j'ai créé le mot pour tuer la chose, sorry, that is a misquote. And the idea that he had was that if we called this by a term that referred to something so foreign to France, maybe this would deter people from practicing it. He pushed it as far as to say that the destruction of art was so contrary to the French genius that it could not possibly have been done by Frenchmen. It must have been the work of English counter-revolutionary spies. Last consequence of the French Revolution, the museums took up a new role. Here we have the Musée du Louvre. Uh, the Palais du Louvre used to be a royal castle and then a military garrison, but it was also where the royal collections of art were stored. After the 10th of August 1793, it became an official museum and it was a very convenient way to hide away some of the works of art that were deemed too precious to run the risk of revolutionary looting. So once you put something in a museum, all of a sudden the icon is sanitized. You would never see anyone worshipping a sacred image in a museum. It is not an icon anymore. It is just a work of art. After the revolution happened, the first heads that had to fall were the heads of the people who caused the revolution. You have Georges Danton, Maximilien de Robespierre, Louis-Antoine de saint just They were all decapitated because they were all likely to become too powerful and potential heads of state. Funnily enough, the French Revolution's obsession with equality led to the enthronement of Napoleon. After the fall of the French monarchy, here you see all the sequence of different regimes that happened. There was a republic, then an empire, a return to the monarchy, a return to the constitutional monarchy, another republic, the second empire, then a third republic, and this third republic lasted onto the Second World War. All of this happened while 
these new regimes would bring new icons, new representations that had to be valued. So for instance, when the monarchy absolute became a thing again, the revolutionary symbols disappeared and the fleur de lis came back. The Enlightenment and the Revolution remained suspicious towards the arts because artistic representations go beyond rationality. The Revolution's extreme desire to control the ideas by reshaping the visual landscape only resulted in uncontrollable mob movements, but they were rooted in political ideology. Iconoclasm can only happen where there are are icons, where there are traces of a past that can be challenged, destroyed, but also conserved and discussed. One of the things that we can learn from the French Revolution is that sanctimonious iconoclasm is very likely to be seen some years or some centuries later, like uneducated and clumsy vandalism. Thank you very much. But it, it, we've been talking about iconoclasm as destruction, but as James has showed us, it, it resulted in a new form of, of art, and you say it re the French Revolution and its destruction result in new symbols, vandalism, and the museums. Tell me more about the, sort of the ideology behind creating the Louvre. Was it just a storage, or did, did those responsible say, we do this because we think this is the best thing to do. Well, they could not explicitly say we do this because we think that this art is valuable. So the argument that was put forward uh, in the National Assembly was most likely to be the financial value of some religious artifacts or works of art that were likely to be stolen, destroyed, burnt. So putting something in a museum was first a way to preserve its material value. But if you look at the private correspondence of people commenting on these objects, they were dreading that there wouldn't be any trace of the French history and the French identity. So the paradox of the French Revolution is that they wanted to create something that was so genuinely French and they found themselves in front of the concrete historical reality that all of this art is genuinely French, although it is most of the times Catholic and monarchic. But were people allowed to visit this museum and were they watched so they wouldn't worship the old pieces well, of art? They were watched, watched and they, there was something quite similar to what is going on in some museums in the UK nowadays, which is that the, the, the explanations that came with the works of art made it very clear that this was not something good. So, for instance, you'd have a representation of a king and he would be described as a tyrant or as someone who did not uphold the values that the revolution maintained. So it was a retain and explain. Were there any iconoclasts who sneaked in with bottles of ketchup or paint or so and threw at these objects? They didn't push it that far. <laughs> <laughs> they, didn't, they didn't have ketchup. <laughs> no, they didn't have ketchup in that time. But Thanks. Thank Welcome you. back. Michael Frieden, welcome. <coughs> so, uh, in the spirit of today's meeting, I've destroyed all images accompanying my talk. The concept of ideologies undermine many assumptions about political thinking. It queries and often erodes symbolic views of the social world that had accrued iconic status. That is to say, outstanding and respected cultural salience. Concurrently, it has challenged several venerated processes of political knowledge evaluation. Ideological Iconoclasm bridges a series of happenings, from immediate physical destruction, as we've heard throughout the day, to the protract protracted negation of beliefs as erroneous and deceptive. The iconic credentials of political ideas had depended on the cast iron reputation of their sources and the irrefutable authority of their claims, 
accompanied either as expressions of divine will conveyed through hallowed texts and their guardians, or as products of rational thinking accessible through the impeccable minds of intellectual and spiritual specialists. All that was about to change. Ideological iconoclasm was boasted by a triple process. First, the uncoupling of knowledge from the certainty of theological faith, which unleashed epistemological pluralism. It introduced contingency as normal, questioning the durability assigned to learned reasoning. Second, breaking with the uncritical adulation of uniquely gifted individuals, initiated a paradigm shift. Fresh political thinking was in principle possible at all levels of society. And third, the grip of older power centers was loosened, as we've just heard following the French Revolution. The increasing participation of excluded sectors in active political life disrupted the prestige of the monarchy and aristocracy that had buttressed the social order and its cerebral and customary certitudes. But there was no uniformity in the nascent meanings of ideology. Each wave of conceptual consolidation iconoclastically rejected the authority under pre underpinning the previous ideological hegemony. Initially, ideology proceeded in two divergent paths, each of which interpreted political Weltanschauung as social products, discrediting their indisputability. The first wave revealed fundamental distortions conveyed through dominant modes of thought such as identifying private property as essential to the human condition. Marx and Engels deflated existing social ideas, bringing them, in their words, down to earth. Ideologies were mystifications to be exposed and removed. Secular tenets claiming correct social insights swept away ideas that reflected false consciousness and socioeconomic alienation. An ideology in the Marxist sense became a denigrating term, undermining bourgeois and exploitative beliefs. Its very identification was meant to eliminate the phenomenon it denoted. Yet in unmasking ideology, Marxists and sociologists of knowledge paradoxically generated a new set of iconic scholars. The debunking of ideology triggered a quest to rebuild authoritative principles of social conduct. Marxism propelled a shift from giving voice to the iconic bearers of truth messages, which had hitherto been secured by their seminal gravitas, to investigating the depersonalized social truths and the social perversions of their production. The renewed pursuit of universal truths was now grounded in radically new theories of human commonality, not in religious belief, not in metaphysics, or not in the so-called natural laws of social superiority. Marx himself, of course, achieved formidable iconic status through the mass acclaim of Marxism analyses, themselves distilled into a widespread ideology tellingly named Marxism, as well as graphically represented and reproduced through Marx's bearded visage from statues to book covers to T-shirts. The next wave relativized beliefs as ephemeral, temporally and spatially anchored. Studying ideology became an anthropocentric endeavor attuned to concrete patterns of social behavior, not the armchair theorizing indulged in by Marx and Engels. The latter claimed to articulate a scientific view that detailed the tribulations of the proletariat and unlocked the truths that would emancipate it. But they wrote in the name of a class, rather than letting the class voice its own understandings. By contrast, for the pioneering social theorist Karl Mannheim, the study of ideologies was concerned, and I quote, with the problem of how men actually think, how thinking really functions in public life and in politics as an instrument of collective action. Mannheim contended that the monopolies of various uh, cognoscenti and, uh, and priestly castes were now broken. The iconoclasm was palpable here because, in, as, he, as Mannheim writes, in this process, the intellectual's illusion that there's only one way of thinking disappears. 
Later ideology was connected to pernicious international political movements as totalitarianism took root in several European countries. Mid 20th century ideologies monopolized the real world discourses in their societies. Icon creation saw revival through populist and manipulative art. A gallery of personalized icons, both worshipped and despised, emerged around Stalin, Hitler, Mussolini, and later Mao in China. In particular, the vigorous imagery of the 1930s Nuremberg rallies, captured by Leni Riefenstahl's stunning cinematography, cemented the marriage of propaganda as an overwhelming visual spectacle with a cult of physicality, race, and leadership. Icons were resurrected as emotional evocations of national exclusivity. In Europe, the breaking down of those powerful ideologies was eventually prompted, of course, by military defeat, but it was also hastened by the souring of those mystical appeals, by the slow percolation of liberal democratic counter ideologies from within, and not least, uh, uh, by the withering impact of iconoclastic political cartoons. National socialist insignia, such as the swastikas, as we know, were subsequently banned by the democratic successor states to the Third Reich. By the late 20th century, the meaning of ideology had mutated, mutated further as microsets of recurring beliefs. Ideology justified or contested the social arrangements of a political community through reflecting the inherent semantic and epistemological fluidity of concepts. Ideology was regarded as a ubiquitous device in multiple formats, competing over plans for public policy through controlling political language to be decoded rather than to be unmasked. More recently, those looser ideological discourses have been circulated not just in vernacular, but in demotic terms, radically demoting them from their past pedestals as respected statements. And their impact lies now in the uninhabited, uninhibited freedom to express opinionated voice, not in their inherent superiority or quality. So the 21st century is witnessing the disintegration of ideologies as a coherent thought practice, and with it the prestige of their discourses and spokespeople. Both style and substance have been profaned. The result has been a disengagement from the iconic eminence of debate and of debaters, and from the discourses that accompanied ideologies as projections of political identities. A chaotic fragmentation has removed the filters that protect the public domain from a cacophonic and super-atomized inundation through down-up electronic channels. The indiscriminate equivalence bestowed by social media and giving vent to badly thought out or malicious voices reduces the capacity to attach variable weight to the myriad voices now effortlessly securing a stage. Ideological stances are privatized and affected by skepticism and ephemerality. And this change of scene requires novel tools for analyzing ideologies, centering on expressivity, on assertions of participant ideology, and on perlocutionary performativity. This approach accepts that ideologies are normal features of political thinking that routinely contain the good, the bad, and the mediocre. They are seen chiefly as propagating and explanatory devices focusing on communicability, on persuasiveness, but not on iconic authority. Iconicism is, of course, also a material activity, and we talked a lot today about the smashing of religious icons, but that practice is also aimed at ideological artifacts. Statues of Lenin were toppled after 1989 as the wall came down. Interestingly, the Budapest Memorial for Victims of the German Occupation has sparked sustained protests. Messages at its base denounced its silence over the Hungarian Nazi collaborators. They're, they're silent. Their history has been erased in this particular sculpture. And those public government-defying gestures differ from private iconoclastic acts, which are often indistinguishable from vandalism, as when Marx's famous likeness over his London grave was anonymously blown up. Was this a, 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 an ideological gesture or just the act of a, of a 
of an uh, unhappy individual. And iconoclasm is often found within nationalist creeds, burning flags, disfiguring crests, and exhuming public figures commonly assert political identity through obliterating rival affirmations of national selfhood. Each ideology attempts to dismantle the foundational credos of its rivals that by default shape the heart of its own arguments. For example, conservatives relentlessly assault the canonical precepts that threaten their ideological dispositions. As the French conservative thinker Joseph de Maistre put it, decrying the cult of universal man, and I quote, I have seen Frenchmen, Italians, Russians, etc., but as for man, I declared I have never in my life met him. For Isaiah Berlin, Master's, Master's mission was to, quote, destroy everything which the 18th century has built up, the very epitome of iconoclasm. Iconoclasm is driven by anger, by violence, by insecurity, and by misrepresentation. Anger, whether irrational or righteous, plays a significant part in the psych psyche of ideologies. Violence is, on the surface, formally restricted to fascist, far-right, and several revolutionary ideologies. Insecurity may be transmogrified into bravado, hiding an existential anxiety. And falsification or selective filtering is rampant as ideologies diminish their opponents' political relevance. Ideological iconoclasm can be assessed through two modes of expression that run through it. The one marshals the emotions that ideology project in attempting to shape the world. Thus, patriotism is a potent tool in an ideology's semantic impact, adding to its power to mobilize or exclude, to legitimate or annihilate. The second mode concerns the methods used to elevate a particular ideology. The case for democracy needs to be patiently assembled, but its commitment to weighing evidence accords it greater durability in the long run. Only some aspects of an ideology can act as a battering ram to shatter ossified counterparts. Thus, liberalism is intransigently rigid on the protection of human rights, while flexible on methods of redistributive justice. The dualism of ideologies as affirming and vilifying instruments places them at the center of the political world. And when reasoning meets a brick wall, the undercurrents of iconoclastic violence remain necessary forms of political drama. Thank you. What you call the chaotic fragmentation of political ideology has moved the focus from the state, the community, the group, and now to, to the individual. We have the political ideology of yes. the self. Yes. Yes, good, because then I would like to ask you, where do we go from here? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm not a futurologist, but uh, uh, what I will say is, is that uh, I think we are now, in, we are now recognizing the, 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 the natural fragmentation of ideologies, which were artificially put together or, or held together by, by power structures and by, and by hierarchies. Ideologies are naturally flimsy and, 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 sh and shifting and fluid constructs. That, that they, 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 you know, some parts drop off from one ideology and are picked up by another. Uh, 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 so they, they, they clash, they, 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 they lose parts, they gain parts. And, and, and it's this, this normal flexibility that means that we will always be in a state yeah. of movement. But chaotic fragmentation sounds rather pessimistic. Could anything good come out of all this? Well, well you see, the, 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 the countervailing part of power of, of, of uh, chaos is, of course, the re-establishment of order. Uh, out, of, out of terror, out of anxiety, uh, out, out of the, the need to, to freeze frame things that, uh, are, that are too mobile to be kept under control. Uh, start all over again. Uh, start all over again or develop some, some new system. We will live long enough to see what happens, Michael. Not, not us, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to replace you with Ingrid Dunier after. Thank, Thank you for very, very much.
crushing the four olds, Ingrid. Yeah. Welcome. Thank you. The summer of 1966 saw what has been referred to as an iconoclastic shock force released in China. And that's what I'm going to talk about a little bit today. I am guessing that all of you are at least a little bit familiar with the great proletarian cultural revolution in China. It is a political campaign or movement really um, launched by Mao Zedong. And his reason for doing so are, well, there are many reasons, but uh, essentially and officially, Mao spoke of the idea that remaining bourgeois elements had infiltrated the party and society at large with the aim of restoring capitalism. And so to counteract this infiltration, uh, the Cultural Revolution was put in motion to renew revolution and spread it to all of China. And one important aim of this was um, to revolutionize people's thinking. Every part of society was to be permeated by uh, the revolutionary spirit. Um, and right at the beginning of this orchestrated chaos uh, was um, that the masses were encouraged to destroy the four olds in a destroy the four olds campaign. Um, and <laughs> the four olds essentially referred to pre-communist elements uh, of Chinese society and culture. And they were, the four ones were old customs, old culture, old habits, and old thinking or ideas. Uh, the term first appeared in June of 1966 in the People's Daily in an editorial by a very famous political theorist, Chen Pota, and it was endorsed by Mao and quickly picked up by leading party officials at mass rallies, and from there it spread into Red Guard publications and from Beijing at the end of the summer to all of China. So it's very quick. In spite of being used at speeches, at mass rallies, and in article magazines, um, magazine articles, sorry, uh, the four olds remained a very vague concept. So the distinction between old and new was uh, never made clear. And furthermore, um, the meaning of the use of words like attack and destroy was also not specified, so that later theorists could claim that by attack they had meant attack verbally or uh, destroy with intellectual critique. But at this time <laughs> in the Cultural Revolution, it was taken in a much more literal sense of physically attacking and destroying objects, places and people. Uh, and which customs, habits, uh, culture and ideas were to be uh, specifically, that specifically constituted the four olds uh, was also never made entirely clear. It remained open for interpretation. And so this lack of precision, uh, when it came to talking about the four olds, um, very quickly manifested itself in a wide array of iconoclastic expressions. As the Red Guards went out and looked for material manifestations of these four olds. Um, religion was one easy and obvious target. Uh, so there are countless examples of this more classic iconoclasm, I'd say, uh, where they uh, attacked churches and mosques and temples and Buddhist temples and destroyed religious imagery, imagery and replaced it oftentimes with pictures of Mao. Um, but uh, religious iconoclasm is just a very small part of what was going on at large. The Red Guards attacked a lot of public property and destroyed historical sites. Uh, in Beijing alone, I think approximately 4,000 of the 6,000 
places uh, designated uh, to be of culture or the historical interest were completely destroyed by the end of the Cultural Revolution. Uh, the tomb of Confucius was desecrated, um, and the Red Guards laid siege to his temple in Shandong. And there they destroyed 6,000 registered cultural artifacts, including more than 2,000 texts, old texts. Uh, and in general, there was a massive confiscation of books during this time. Any book, really, old or new, found not to be in conformity with Mao Zedong thought, were burned, essentially, or confiscated. But there were a lot of book burnings. Um, so, we have seen that uh, these four old categories encompassed literal old artifacts, but also uh, it could be any modern object that could be associated with or seen as an, a symbol of China's more recent but pre-communist history. Um, so, symbols of imperialism and capitalism, for example, such as neon lights, blue jeans, suits made in Hong Kong, were all targeted by the Red Guards. Uh, women wearing long braids, uh, these braids could be seen as a remnant of the feudal past and were sometimes cut by force. Uh, inscription in foreign languages were chiseled off on uh, buildings or smashed with hammers. And the tumultuous events escalated further as Red Guards broke into private homes looking for the four olds and sacked people's homes and smashed anything that could be an expression such as gramophone records, musical instruments, um, porcelain. Um, there is, as far as I know, no official reliable statistic of the cost of the damage done during this time. But uh, the Chinese are, and have been since uh, the late 80s, I'd say, uh, putting great effort in rebuilding, <laughs> um, trying to rebuild the, the cultural sites that were lost, damaged, or destroyed during this time. So, moving past the actual destruction, and looking a little bit about to, to un trying to understand this, um, the driving force behind these actions, um, it could be interesting to look a little bit at what the participants themselves wanted to achieve, I think. Um, to destroy the objects and images and, and works of art, in this case, was seen as a guarantee that the changes in the political system would last, uh, that there would be no relapse back to the old society. I think the iconoclasm in this case was a complement of utopianism, in a sense. Um, or maybe put another way, uh, Maoism as an ideology uh, incorporates elements that bear strong um, resemblance to kiliasm, or at any rate, millinerism. So th this is nurturing the idea that there will be a fundamental transformation of society after which all things will be entirely different and better also. And this idea was a very powerful motivator um, for these iconoclasts. The Red Guards were clearly driven by the thought that a massive improvement of society could be achieved almost immediately and um, with no compromise, seemingly. Um, uh, an important component of Mao Zedong thought is the promise of more revolutions to come. He speaks of this quite often. Uh, and this is a kind of purgatory um, thought to be required for China's ultimate entry into socialist utopia, finally. So we say that um, Followers of Mao Zedong, I think, were particularly open to the idea of a major cataclysm or transformative event like this. And, and uh, as a side note, this did, this, this did not just apply to uh, the Red Guards in China. Um, the culture and politics of the Cultural Revolution permeated global radicalism for a while during the 60s and 70s. Uh, Maoist movements across the US and Europe attracted uh, not only a lot of young radicals, but also 
a lot of talented writers and famous intellectuals. Uh, the Chinese experiment was in many cases seen and viewed as an impressive and exciting utopian effort, I'd say. Um, we can look a little bit at the rhetoric of the Cultural Revolution, it's quite telling. The past is often rejected as something dirty and dusty to be swept away or discarded. And Mao Zedong himself often speaks, or at times at least, in cleaning and cleansing metaphors of the need to sweep and wash society or dust um, the minds of uh, your comrades, otherwise the dust will accumulate. Uh, uh, and he also refers to the revolutionary struggle as an antitoxin that not only rids us of the enemy's poison, but cleans, pur purges us of our own filth. This is a very Mao way of speaking. Um, and as these metaphors hint at, uh, these are not seen by the participants as acts of complete destruction. Uh, on the contrary, they are viewed as acts of purification and creation of building something entirely new and better. Uh, the dirty past is being removed entirely so that instead a clean and pure future can be put in its place. Uh, calls to destroy the four olds were almost always accompanied by calls to create the four news, that is new customs, new habits, new culture, new ideas. Uh, to the participants then, um, the iconoclasm was a destructive act meant to be constructive. Uh, it was seen as a necessary uh, part of the sought after irreversible transformation of society and the transformation in the patterns of thought and behavior of the Chinese people. Um, this, the most intense iconoclastic period of the Cultural Revolution lasted for, I'd say, about a year, and then was somewhat halted in 1967. Uh, then something interesting happened. Uh, <laughs> the Central Committee issued a statement stressing now the importance of preserving the cultural artifacts created by the laboring people throughout history. Uh, places, objects uh, and books were now to be preserved as negative teaching material and objects of criticism. Uh, and, and now was raised also, and this is reminiscent a little bit of, of the uh, revolution in France, the idea was raised for revolutionary museums, they were called. Uh, collections of cultural relics would be preserved as the people's property uh, and used for class education. So the argument now, finally, or after a year of this, was put forward that progress in the modern society could only be measured in comparison with the past. Thank you. Thank you. What would you say survived of the old fours and what has been secretly reintroduced? In, if we take a look at today's China, what, what, what is the result of the Cultural Revolution? Uh, I mean, the, uh, I think that the Chinese themselves are pretty open to admitting that the, the Cultural Revolution was one big failure, essentially. <laughs> but what survived uh, physically, a lot of things survived simply because the, they didn't have time to destroy all of it. Uh, one known example is the Forbidden City in Beijing that was mm -hmm. saved by Zhou Enlai, who heard that the Red Guards were going to attack it and ordered the military in to protect it, essentially. So there was a lot of that infighting going on in the a party, counter, too. A counter-iconoclasm. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And, and doing so, anyone trying to protect these four olds did t take a considerable risk. Because mm -hmm. I have not really been talking about the loss of human life during mm. this period, which was also immense. So, uh, But for today, no, there has been a great revival of certain aspects of 
Chinese history. There, there's a great interest in China in uh, historical relics and an attempt to buy from outside of the country also to reclaim uh, Confucius mm. um, is a bi big again mm. <laughs> after many campaigns against him. So, mm. um, But the, the, yeah, they did manage to smash a lot. Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah, thank you. We'll come back. And our next speaker is Per Arne Boudin on Russian icons, I suppose. During the first dec decades of the Soviet era, there existed a strong iconoclastic force inspired and led by the Communist Party. I ha here have in mind icons in the narrow sense of the sacred art or the awful church. Churches were demolished, icons were gathered up for destruction as public events. The oldest icons, however, were placed in museums as cultural heritage. This tendency to regard icons and other devotional objects as an important part of Russian cultural heritage, yet lacking in any religious significance, gained in strength, especially during the 1960s. But more generally, during the final decades of the Soviet era, Stalin himself founded the Rublyov Museum for Icons after the Second World War. That is, at the same time, certain icons were de declared as extremely precious objects, and most others were destroyed with the same fervor, with the same in intensi intensivity. Iconoclasm was after Soviet times perceived as a negative value associated with Soviet rule and Soviet persecution more than as a part of an avant-gardistic technique of destroying an ossified cultural heritage. When Kiev and Rus was baptized in 1988, by monks from Byzantium, the controversy between iconodules and iconophiles had already been solved in favor of the icons. Or furthermore, a demand to use them in devotional practice in church as well as in personal prayer. The Iconoclastic idea was, however, present in the radical intelligentsia in the second half of the 19th century. Icons were regarded with derision by them. One spectacular example may be found in the biography of the most famous of all Russian philosophers, Vladimir Solovyov. When he turned atheist in his youth, one of his first steps uh, was to throw his icon out of the window. Today, in post-Soviet Russia after 1991, and even more during the last years, the situation is quite different. Icons are painted once again, and in almost every home there are icon re reproductions, icons, and often a multitude of them. You could even talk of an inflation or a flood of holy images in Russian society of today. Icons 
having been confiscated by the Soviet state of the revolution, have been restituted to the church, often accompanied by severe criticism on the part of the museums, as they fear that the exhibits will be damaged in the churches because uh, of the suit from candles and the variation in indoor climate. New icons are painted with traditional motifs, but many of them, de uh, they depict new martyrs. That is, Orthodox Christians who fell victims to the Soviet powers because of their Christian faith. This is the most important innovation in the field of icon painting during the post-Soviet period. There has also been taking place what I would call political canonizations. One case is the canonization uh, of Fyodor Ushakov, one of the most successful admirals of Catherine uh, the Great. His pro uh, promotion to saint uh, is uh, in line with the orth Russian Orthodox tradition of turning victorious military leaders into saints, as Alexander Nevsky. The icon depicting Admiral Ushakov is really nothing other than a copy of the oil painting with a halo added. The abundant use of icon, icons reproduce, uh, reproducing, reproduced on paper has be, been defined by some Russian theologians today as an iconoclastic heresy. There ought to be only originals. The same accusation has been raised against the, uh, the like of abundant use of icon motifs in commercial products as souvenirs. And this crit critique of the abundance of reproductions is of the same kind as the one put in forth by Walter Benjamin, but not in relation to icons, but in relation to art in general. There are also open iconoclastic phenomena. I will take one example. It's uh, a piece of art from in 1998 by the ar artist uh, Ter Oganyan. In this performance, the public in the exhibition hall was invited to spit on reproductions of icons, to draw swastikas on them, and to chop at them with an X. However, no one wanted to do that. Then the artist did it himself and uh, 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 take, took a photo of it. The performance was stopped and he was put on trial for inciting religious hatred. In the controversy of this performance, the artist and his colleagues mentioned that it was directed against the growing and negative role of the church in the new post-Soviet uh, conservative Russia. The problem was that the performance was situated by the artist himself in the context of an avant-gardistic revolt, but for the church and much of the public it was situated in uh, a completely different context of the atrocities of the Soviet, uh, of his, uh, Soviet harassments of believers known for the elderly generation. And did he attack an icon or did he attack uh, a reproduction that is in principle being iconoclastic, because an icon must be an original.
What is at stake is the role of materiality and the, rela the relation between original and copy. The criticism against the church and its alliance with the secular power was continued the years to come by Pussy Riot and uh, later on by Piotr Pavlensky. And in both cases, it led to severe punishments. Any use of icons and icon motifs in secular art is condemned by church. And it seems uh, more or less uh, impossible to exhibit, exhibit such art in today's Russia. The church means to have the copyright, so to say, for icons. In a sermon in March last year, a few weeks after Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine, the patriarch of Russian church, Kirill, claimed that orthodoxy was as threatened today as in the 8th and 9th centuries in the time of iconoclasm and then by hostile foreign powers, meaning, meaning the West. March last year, on the special day for uh, celebrating the victory uh, over the in iconoclasm, that is uh, the first day of uh, Great Lent, the triumph of orthodoxy is the name of the, uh, of the day. The most famous of all icons, Andrei Rublev's Old Testament Trinity, confiscated after the revolution in 1917 and then passed to the Tretyakov Gallery, was, if temporarily, returned to its original place in the monastery of St. Sergei after it, against the will of the museum. And all it, 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 people working in the museum, they were against this transportation of the most famous of all Russian icons, of all icons, I think, it, to the, the monastery. But it was done. And here you see it. According to my mind, it was a gift to the church for its full support of the Russian war in Ukraine. Thank you.